Okay, before we get started, uh, is someone able to uh, share the uh, the agenda? Good morning. Yes, I can help with that. Thank you so so very much. You're welcome. Okay, so um, to get started, we have some, uh, we definitely have some agenda bashing to do. So um, the next uh, event that we, so let's, let's start with agenda bashing and then we'll go to the events. Uh, is there anything that any, anyone would like to, uh, to discuss? I think we're good at this point. I, I, I think we're sort of good at this point. It might be useful to add an item for a little bit of, of cross discussion around getting some of the hardware based CI working um, at um, Packet, because I know that's something I've been looking at. And I know we've got other folks in the call who've been looking at it. So that, that might be something worth talking about. If for nothing else, then just sort of commiserate. Okay, I think that's a good idea. And I'll stick that before we do any discussion on the Mellanox one, since that's related. And if it turns out that, the, that we talk about the Mellan, some of the Mellanox stuff in the process of that, then um, we can go ahead and skip that. Yeah, no, that would be, that would be really, really good. Okay, and I think we need to do an, uh, a OSS recap. So I mean, this sounds like fun. Um, on upcoming events, do we want to, yeah, ONS Europe, definitely. We probably also want to do KubeCon, because one way or the other, you know, even if it means we have to commandeer a bar somewhere, we're definitely going to do something at KubeCon. All right, so uh, we should uh, grab the dates as well and stick that on. So, great. So. In that scenario, let's go ahead and uh, get started. So the next upcoming event is in ONS uh, Open Networking Summit in Amsterdam. So if you're going to Amsterdam or you happen to live nearby Amsterdam uh, and you want to talk to either me or Kyle, I don't, I don't believe Ed will be there, but Kyle and I will definitely be there. Then come along. We have a uh, presentation that we're that we're giving, and uh, hof and hopefully we'll uh, drum up a lot more visibility and support of what we're working on. Um, let's see. KubeCon is, I believe, at the end of November or the beginning of December. So we have a few months until uh, until then. So. Yeah, the CFP for that's closed, but um, I think the years the FIDO day st is still open. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. And um, so we've added a couple submissions to um, to KubeCon. So we'll have to see what happens in the process of that. Uh, my so one of the recommendations I had, I don't see him on the meeting right now. Uh, Oh, yeah, he's here. Okay, so one of my suggestions is uh, uh, Thomas has been working on a VPP, uh, a cross connect with VPP, and I think that that would be an excellent uh, submission. So if you haven't, if you haven't added that already, uh, I would definitely recommend that you do so. Are you saying Tom Herbert? 
Yeah, that's right. He's not on the call. Um, he's trying to, he, <laughs> he RC'd me. He's in uh, the DPDK summit in Ireland and he's having trouble connecting from, um, from a cafe or something there. So he's trying to figure out the right number to call in at from Ireland. So uh, he's not uh, actually on the call, but trying to get in at this moment. Ah, I misread the, um, well, he signed in to the document, but then he couldn't get into the, um, blue or to the zoom window. Cool. Um, So there is also KubeCon um, China going on in Shanghai, and we're, we're trying to work out if that's uh, if that's something that we can fit our budgets into um, in regards to speaking for about network service mesh. So, um, so we'll 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 know more about that later. Um, okay, in terms of um, so in terms of uh, action items, this. Uh, Go ahead and uh, hop onto hop onto that. So, so one of the um, so there's a, a couple things that have been uh, going on. Uh, first, is there's continued to be work on SRV, and I know that SR, uh, that uh, uh, Sergey has been spending. Uh, uh, considerable amount of time on SRIOV to to get that all working. So um, I'll let you talk a little bit about where uh, where you're at with that. Uh, sure. So basically, uh, most of the work is done, and uh, right now there are uh, two components. One component is a binary. Uh, so far, it's a standalone binary, which uh, basically scans the host and prepares the config map, which is then used by a controller, which is running on um, on the host providing SREV services. Uh, the the bits are running on one of the uh, packet net server. Uh, it seems to be okay. Uh, there were some like a minor test done. Uh, to talk to the um, VFs devices or uh, VFIO devices seems to be okay, but uh, there's a part missing with which is the actual data plane. And I mean, right now there's an effort somehow to bring either uh, VPP or DPDK to be able to actually test the data plane part of this uh, solution. So that's it for me. Yeah, so, so basically, we, we think we have working SROV, but until packets start flowing, uh, one is always a little bit um, wary. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and I know that, that you know, this is part of what I was wanting to talk about about getting CI working on packet, because I know that there are a bunch of different efforts going on between network service mesh and some of the VNF CNF comparison stuff at CNCF, where I, I think we, we both have a really strong interest in getting minimally uh, T-Rex, which is the packet generator, and um, VDP working in the packet environment, because you know between if we get those two things going, then we can all really do all kinds of cool things. So, is there um, is there anything that you're blocked on that we're able to to help you with, or? Um... Well, I, mean, I can discuss some of the issues that are going on, and I know we've got Michael on the call who can say even more things than I can, because he's been bleeding into that a lot. But I, I think the, the, the challenge that I think I've seen has been um, most of the packet mix are Mellanox mix, which are wonderful mix. Unfortunately, their drivers are problematic. Uh, in particular, the DPDK1805 drivers um, were broken. Um, and so there's a patch that fixes them um, in VPP. So if you go get the latest uh, VPP 1807 um, from the stable 1807 branch or from master, you can build with Mellanox drivers, although that that's challenging. I know Michael spent a lot of effort trying to get that going. Um, and, and so there are, there are just challenges with using Mellanox in general um, that we're sort of working through. And I think it's not so much that the drivers don't eventually work well, it's just the consumability of them is tricky. Ed, just for clarification, those um, patches are on the stable branch, but not in the latest release? 
so the, the Stable 1807 release for VPP um, should be having a dot release at some point, hopefully next week. And so they will be in the dot release. Um, they're not. They're not in the dot zero release. Is they're not saying. in the dot zero release. We actually found out because we rolled the release out, and a whole bunch of people started saying, "Hey, you know what's going on? Mellanox isn't working." And and what it turned out was Mellanox had done things in DPD eighteen oh five to break their their drivers um, around some of the IOMMU stuff, and so everybody got their heads together. There was a big collaboration. Everyone moved fast, and we got patches upstream where VPP will patch its version of DPDK when it builds. But I know that you've got some connection, Billy, with the packaging of DPDK for, um, for you know, CentOS and RHEL. Um, it would be really, really good to get the patch that fixes this stuff into distro packaging as soon as humanly possible. Um, I know I've been talking to the Debian packages for DPDK about that as well. Okay, um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to Tom Herbert. Um, I don't think the 1807 has moved into the CentOS NFE SIG yet, and so it may be worthwhile instead of pushing the main release, to the, the first release to go in as dot one release, so that might, timing might work out okay for that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I tend to think of this problem systemically. Like, the, the first was to stop the bleeding with VPP by patching DPDK when we build it, but the, the second then is to make sure the patches go upstream to DPDK and that the, the back ports go upstream to the packagers because DPDK 1808 has already come out, um, but we can fix the 1808 that goes into distros and we should. Right. All right. Do you, do you have things you would like to add to this whole discussion? No, no, and I actually don't use Melanox. I would just want a clarification just so I understood, but I don't actually use the Melanox myself. So it was really just an informational point to, or clarification. No, I think that's good. And, and Michael, you, you and you, Michael Pedersen, I know you've been working on a lot of this stuff. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, well, I can, I can add a bit. I see you have my, my notes open right now. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you so much for those notes, by the way. Yeah, I think those, those need a bit of an update. I have some, some more notes, and I just need to, to make them look a little better, and then I'll probably update at some point. Yep. Um, but, um, but generally, one, it, it, this is yeah, it. One thing about those notes that I will note, by the way, <clears throat> um, in poking around with core OS, which is what cross cloud CI is using by default, um, it does appear that, that core OS has IOMMU on by default and has huge pages set equal to two meg by default. So it looks like, at least with core OS, you don't actually have to tweak kernel parameters in order to get the right things available at the kernel level, but I'm not entirely completely sure of that. Oh, that's, that, that would at least be good, but I guess you can't really save any reboots regardless, since I think after, uh, after changing the settings in the Mellanox firmware, then it asks you to reboot as well. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, is there, like, what we did initially with them is that uh, we, we could work, because it's still an ongoing process with Mellanox uh, to support the DPDK by default, because of their OFED dependency. It's always because of the OFED dependency. So one thing we could look at is, can we work with Mellanox like they did for us, is they pre-build their images. They, they, they pre-build the, the packages for either Debian or uh, uh, Ubuntu, like they did, and we use this one. So they, uh, we, they publicize the repo pre-build daily so we could leverage them. Well, that, that would be good, but there would be two things that I'd want to really strongly press them about. One is include the flipping fix so that the drivers are usable. Um, and then the second one is they actually do publish Debian packages, but in a very unhelpful way right now. Uh, you can go click through a bunch of stuff to download them, but I would really love to see them make them available via something like a package cloud after yum repo so that you could just flipping point to an after yum repo and install them. That would be unbelievably helpful. I guess, if anything, I can add a few more details about uh, <laughs> my package generator then. Um, so what I ended up doing there was, since I'm running everything in a container, um, I found that uh, T-Rex, the version of T-Rex that I'm using, I think it's 2.32, only supports uh, an older version of OFET. So I actually went and installed that one. And then for the container, I had to share all the, the host libraries with the container and uh, then it looks like it, it works. 
Yeah, is it because you're using an older version of T-Rex or is there something that yes. needs to be fixed? Okay, so it's been fixed in more recent T-Rexes. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm using the old one that's, that's uh, packaged with, with in, a, in a V-Bench, the Cisco framework okay. for, for um, in a VI testing. Okay, the, the reason I was asking is, I, you know, Hedok, who's the PTL for T-Rex, is a good friend. So yeah. if there's something that's actively broken in T-Rex, that hasn't been fixed, I can go talk to him about it. But if it's something he has fixed in more recent versions, you know, I'm gonna get a very um, interesting response from him if I complain about problems that are already fixed. Uh, yeah, I, I know of how, how most of them feel about doing things for older versions. I guess they, they have quite a short support window. Why, in terms of why not just use T-Rex directly? I know that's typically what Fido does, is just use um, directly. The, the, the problem doing that, if, if we want to make any like, actual measurements, any PDR and NDR tests, then we'll still need to write the cases for, for setting up the traffic and setting up the flows. You, you, may wanna, you may wanna reach out and talk to some of the FIDO CSIP guys, because they do that. They literally run thousands and thousands of performance tests. Yeah, no, I think it, it, that might be, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that might be good at a later point, but for now it just, in a V bench is so easy when it works. It takes 10 minutes to set up and then you have measurements running. No, no, I, I understand. It yeah. just sounds like you know, with, with, with all the issues we're hitting, we may be blowing more time into working with antiquated things. Mm. That's morning. true, but at least I, I think I have a solution for it now. Awesome, that's good. It, it, when, you, when you get a little more settled, if you could add more comments to this, because this is a lot of the, the breadcrumbs. I'm, I'm basically following the breadcrumbs from this and from the instructions that Sergey posted. Yeah, um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely add whatever I have once once I have it in a state where it's shareable. <laughs> well, you're sure you're not saying things that are less helpful rather than more. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so th this is this is goodness. Um, cool. Anyone have anything else they want to add on this? So I think um, I think that we can uh, continue on to uh, to the next part. So uh, so another another thing that uh, I've that I've been working on is I've been circling back and I'm starting to I'm I want to uh, start moving more components towards the uh, plugin model and uh, work out and start refactoring it so the the system so that it becomes more uh, more testable. So I think a major uh, component of our success is going to be in uh, continuing to increase testability so that as things change, you know, even though it's still a simple project, you know, we still want to have confidence in our, in our changes over time. So, uh, so there's going to be quite a bit of work on my part in order to, in order to do that. Um, Kyle, did you want to add anything on your side about some of the stuff that you're that you're doing? Because I know you're looking at some of the uh, the CI stuff, and I'm not seeing anything else on the agenda that um, uh, that you've that you've been working on. So it helps if I unmute as well. I realize now, uh, <laughs> but can can you all hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, the stuff that I worked on this week was Ed and I, Ed, Ed was looking at the CRD code a bit last week. And, and of course, everyone was traveling. So I never had a chance to circle back with them until Tuesday. But, um, but essentially, um, I, I pushed a patch and Ed and Sergey reviewed and merged, uh, which basically now, now, now we, we automatically generate open API uh, v3 validations for all our CRDs as well. Um, I think it's the uh, uh, yeah it's the third one there uh, uh, the fixed CRD code to auto generate so that one so that one was pushed and merged and that that's actually pretty slick because it it now means that that you know all all of that validation code which was written by hand before and required you know syncing with you know if any of that ever changed uh, in our CRDs now it's all just it's auto generated and automatically should get validated the, the correct way as well so. Um, but yeah, that that that's basically what I worked on this week. And then after that, I made our CRD creation a little bit more robust. Um, I know I talked to Sergey. Sergey's gonna, I think he's gonna push out a patch uh, to modify the CRD creation a little bit more, even uh, yet again. Um, 
but yeah, so basically it was all about this week. I spent a bunch of time on these uh, CRDs and making that a little bit more robust and less error prone and more, more automated. Yep, and if we could if we could also make sure that the the documentation is clear and up to date because I, I when I was trying to follow the documentation it looked like there were missing steps. Now that doesn't mean there are missing steps. It just means that it, you know there was confusion on my part. But it, it's worth revisiting from there because I know that folks yeah, would yeah. like to start. You know we've got a couple of ambitions about. In fact, it's probably worth talking about the um, the, the the stuff about channels versus not channels that's, uh, in this call. Um, yeah, I think we can do that next. But I so the other thing that makes that helps, uh, uh, Frederick. I know you pushed and I merged the patch, which fixed uh, you know the default target for make, which was uh, uh, an obvious oversight by us. But that's super slick as well because now if you just type make, you get the desired result. So <laughs> yeah, I ran into a build break that uh, Travis broke, but my local environment didn't. So I was like, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> but no, that's that's really cool. Yeah, so Ed, maybe now maybe now's a good time to to you want to lead that discussion on the channel stuff uh, as well. Yeah, no. So like, one of the things that I've been noticing um, is when, when when I originally when we originally started talking about network services, we were sort of hewing very close to the patterns that existed in Kubernetes services. And when you look at a Kubernetes service, you've got a service that has names and then it has uh, ports, and, it, and a Kubernetes service can have multiple ports. And, and so at the time we said, well, calling something in networking a port is probably not a service to the world, given how other many other things are named ports. And so we sort of called them channels. And in, in thinking through the whole thing, um, I'm coming to be of the opinion, and I, I think Kyle is as well, that we should just have, you know, get away with, the, you know, do away with the channel concept and just have a network service support a single kind of payload. Um, so that if you if you need multiple of them, you just have multiple network services. It kind of simplifies a bunch of things in the architecture to go that route. Um, channels end up introducing a lot of complexity and a lot of like weird questions about how you do them. Um, and I'm not sure how much value they're actually bringing us. Um, but I did want to sort of, of raise that here and see what everyone else's opinions were before we started hacking through code and stuff. Did, did any of that make sense at all to anyone? <laughs> uh, yeah, when I was playing with the NSC and um, NSM, I mean, I, I I couldn't I couldn't find a way to fit the channel concept in this. So I mean, it seemed a bit redundant and uh, at least in that specific scenario, not useful. So I mean, yeah, that's what uh, pre pretty much what you're saying as we seeing as well. So yeah, I mean, it, makes, it makes sense to me. And some of this, quite honestly, was watching you working on this with the NSC and the NSM going, why am I making Sergey's life so hard? I shouldn't be making Sergey's life so hard. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. You know, and, and some of this would just involve some nomenclature changes. Like right now, there's a gRPC call that a network service endpoint makes where it says exposed channel. And that would just become something like exposed network service. Yeah. And, um... When I when I was thinking through these uh, through these scenarios, um, I wasn't able to, th to think of any scenario where not having multiple channels uh, didn't um, like where things were unexpressible. Um, and I know that Ed's gone through this exercise several times as well. So, and in fact, most of the exercises that we do when we discuss about uh, when we're doing request to service and accept and so on. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, one of the things that I noticed was we're not there's, we're not making a mention of any channels in there whatsoever, and all the examples still make sense. And so, uh, it, so in, in that scenario, I, I, I think it'd be I think it would be a good idea to just further further simplify it and, and do away with it. Okay. No, I mean, I, I think this is probably for the good. I think it's also important for us to have these conversations as communities, as a community, because I, I can't tell you the number of times I've, I've been in situations where people run off and do things they think are smart and come back and someone is like, wait, 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 that is actually really important to me. Um, let me explain why this is not where we want to go. Um, so it's better to sort of talk these things through ahead of time. Um, cool. Awesome. 
So it sounds like the consensus is to do away with channels. Um, and so we'll just have network services and a network service will have a payload type. So cool. All right. So next item on the uh, agenda. So let's go ahead and um, talk a little bit on the um, open the open source summit. So Ed gave a fantastic talk to the CNCF work group that was on Tuesday, the day before the conference. Ninety three uh, slides in twenty five minutes. And I have three slides in, in, in 20, was it 20 or 25 minutes, but simultaneously, uh, it didn't feel like 93 slides. <laughs> so, which is good because the presentations with 93 slides in that amount, short amount of time usually feel rushed, but no, it, it, it went really, really well and got the point across, I think. Um, and it's actually really uncanny because the person from TELUS, uh, I think it was Sana who gave a talk. She gave the talk and listed all of her problems. And then Ed's presentation was like, here are all the solutions to your problems, like one for one. <laughs> it was really, really uncanny. And they did not coordinate. <laughs> yeah, it was even the same order. I swear to God, there was no coordination involved. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, uh, so I think um, we've... Uh, all the conversations I had over there with various uh, various people were were very positive. Um, so I think, um, um, Ed, I'll let you talk about some of the interactions that uh, that you had and uh, and some of the out uh, some of the outcomes that you've uh, that you've took away from it. Yeah. No. So I mean, there were uh, effectively people were incredibly, incredibly happy. They identified really closely with the kinds of problems that we were, we had. Uh, there were, there were folks who, who commented, they identified very closely. I was telling sort of the Sarah and the um, secure internet connectivity story. Lots of people identified with the character and in particular with the sort of Sarah's definition of hell problems that um, everybody was running, that, that everyone runs into. So, you know, there was a very strong sense from folks in the audience. This is really where they wanted to go. Um, which is always a positive thing. Now, of course, now we have to keep typing faster so we can actually deliver it to them so they can go. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it ended up being, I think, a very positive experience overall. Um, All right. Um Let's see, one, uh, one thing that we need to do, I still have that server running, so I need to copy over those uh, few questions and move them over to the uh, frequently asked questions so that uh, they're yeah. part, of the, um, part of the markdown and not forwarding to another server, so. I think that's probably a good idea. It was, it was nice to have the live questions and answers available on the website. Um, and, and it also turns out to be massively handy to, um, the, the QR code stuff still makes me so happy because uh, I had a couple of places where various people pulled me aside asking for pointers and I could just bring up the mobile phone and give them the QR code directly to the website. All right, so um, just a, a short if a short to do as well. So uh, Kyle and I need to you prepare our slides for uh, the ONS. Uh, so just, just as a slight, uh, to do thing. So we'll I've, I've got the template. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will also spend some time on that this afternoon and you and I can sync up one-on-one -on -one and, and we have a ton of material to pull from. So that's why I haven't been stressing about it too much because, um, you know, I think with a day or two of kind of focused, uh, focused time on it, we'll be able to nail it pretty quick. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree. I'm, I, I... Yeah, two, two things I would suggest on prepping the slides. One is, remember, we just killed channels. <laughs> so lots of that collateral exactly. require, will require a little well, bit of that, Yeah, um, exactly. That's, that's the need to get that pull request out and merge, too. <laughs> yeah. the, the other thing is, what we don't have a lot of collateral on right now, but that people seem super, super interested in every time I talk to them about it, are ENSMs and PNSMs. Um, like super, super exciting to people. Um, although I, 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 
So ENSMs are the external network service managers uh, and PNSMs are proxy network service managers. And uh, an ENSM will let you have a participant in the network service mesh that is external to your cluster, whether that's a different cluster or some, something that's managing physical network stuff. Um, and a PNSM will let you basically insert a control plane helper into the service function chain. Um, so if you had things like, if you're doing segment routing v6, and so you, know, you, you end up with segment routing v6 as your underlying carriage. Well, the, the two ends of the network service mesh that live in the cluster only really know about the SIDs for IPv6 that they know about. You might want to stick a proxy NSM in there to add additional SIDs to the SID list. Um, you know that you that allows you to insert some wisdom about the physical network. Um, so those are two exciting things we don't have a lot of good collateral on yet. Um, although I'm, I'm not quite sure with PNSM how to represent it. Uh, PNSMs are sort of the lightsaber of the network service mesh world. They can cut through anything, but you should be strong in the force, or you're going to cut off your own arm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I found PNSMs really, uh, really useful when someone tries to to say that uh, network service mesh, like to look at the general pattern of the CRD and and look at the general pattern of uh, of the standard ENSM. And uh, one of the questions constant that will sometimes be brought up is, well, it doesn't really handle. Uh, Use cases where some form of omniscience or uh, some where something really advanced that requires very tight coordination from all parts of the chain uh, and have to be uh, have to be taken into consideration before any decision can be made. And uh, so introducing the PNSM at that moment is uh, is very very handy. So. Um, Okay, well, in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, time and, and priority, I think we should discuss the uh, packet.net uh, and what we want to do to get uh, continuous integration running on there. So first to note, um, we have packet.net uh, accounts. So that was uh, gracious, graciously provided by both CNCF and uh, and packet.net. And so one of the things that um, uh, that we need is, well, first make sure that everyone who is going to work on it has access to to packet, that they have a username that uh, that uh, and access to the group. So uh, I, I know that I've sent requests off to um, to Kyle, Ed, uh, Sergey, and uh, I think Ian Wells also has access. So, is so one of the questions is: Is there anyone who wants to help or is or is helping uh, that doesn't have access? Okay. So, uh, if anyone decides to to jump in on any of this stuff. Uh, get get a hold of me and uh, and we'll we'll work out access. Uh, one of the okay, so one of the things in this particular this area then. So uh, I'll give a little bit of uh, of a backdrop on what I'm thinking. So right now, so Travis can be ran in two modes. You can run it as a, in a VM mode or in a container mode. Right now we're running it in a VM mode because we have requirements that uh, that require root and require capabilities outside of the container. So of course this ends up slowing down our initial starting time because um, it has to spin up the VM and simultaneously we're running Kubernetes within uh, within that VM and that VM is very slow. And so uh, the so the, the initial setup from from my view was that we continue we keep packet but we switch packet we, sorry, we keep Travis, but we switch Travis to container mode, so we get a very fast start. Travis can then send the, the appropriate commands to to packet in order to uh, spin up or spin down a uh, cluster. Uh, so we're gonna have to think a little bit about uh, how we want to deal with this in terms of of uh, authentication and so on. Make sure that we don't get exposed uh, credentials, and uh, and think about how we want to approach this. 
Um, and the other, th the other thing that we need to work out as well is like, I think it'd be a good idea to keep the unit test on Travis, but we push the Kubernetes integration test to, uh, to packets specifically. Um, and so uh, my understanding is that, that there hasn't been work on this done just yet. And so that's, that's gonna be one of the big tasks. Uh, does anyone else want to add anything, uh, add anything to that in terms of the high level overview? Yeah, I think that's about right. All right. So, uh, in terms of um, so in terms of details, um, how do we want to approach this? Like, do we want to split up the the tasks into a series of uh, of smaller bytes that we can, because like one of the things I want to be careful with is I don't want to end up without a CI system as well while we're making this transition and say, hey, there's no CI until we get it all up. Yeah, I, I think we have to keep we have to keep the CI we have going um, until we actually have something working um, that's different. I was actually kind of toying with the notion because you know as we make this transition. The real work of the CI is going to be happening in things like packet, but the control you still want to control point with nice webhooks. So I was actually literally looking at you know maybe playing with this in Circle C, um, while keeping going the stuff we have in Travis, and just not making the Circle C stuff voting until we get it working. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be that way, but um, I, I've worked with those Circle C and Travis, and there are pluses and minuses to both. Does GitHub have the ability to say that this isn't a voting thing and just to give uh, stats on it? Sorry, does GitHub have that ability? Uh, that's a good question, I don't know. If it doesn't, uh, one option that we have as well is we can fork the, uh, the repo and uh, focus on getting a Travis setup uh, that uh, that works with it as well. So, sorry, uh, get a Circle CI version. So that that might be an option. But uh, my preference, of course, would be non-voting, and then we switch the voting from one to the other. So, so that's something we need to look into. Is can we can we get uh, can we get voting? Okay, so another um, so another thing as well is uh, uh, another approach we can look at is see if there's any webhooks that uh, we can use to ship some of this stuff off to our to uh, packet.net. Like we could keep a small. Um, so if if it turns out the credentials are an issue, uh, setting up a webhook where we have something that listens and and acts as on our behalf to set up such systems may also uh, may also work. So that so we'll so we have an alternative if, if we if we don't have a way of getting those credentials in place. So my my biggest concern is primarily someone uh, typing echo credentials into into the logs and then getting a, getting an output of username, passwords, tokens, etc. So that's. Yeah, we protect against that in master for Docker at the moment because Travis will only unload those secrets within uh, merged code. But this is this is stuff that we that we want to run on every on every commit, and so that becomes a little a little bit more problematic. Yeah, I, I know both Travis. I know Travis. Both Travis and Circle C have really good ways of managing secrets. Um, and for example, we use them right now for pushing to Docker Hub. So I'm not that concerned about being able to manage secrets in those systems. Okay. Um, so, so what are the tasks that uh, do we need? So we need also to spin up a Kubernetes cluster on packet itself as a, as a task. Um, there's also questions around uh, SR, SRIOV. So do we want these systems to have SRIOV? And my intuition is yes. Yeah, I would say we, we definitely do because it's one of the cases we want to test. Yeah, and you cannot test it without the Kubernetes cluster. So, I mean, these two goes together, absolutely. 
Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I, I'm, I'm made intensely nervous by the fact that we don't have good CI around the SROV stuff. Um, I know that the folks who are working on it are being assiduous about testing the changes they make. Um, but, you know, I feel so much better knowing that good testing is running and, and I know everyone wants to get there. Yeah, I hundred percent agree. And, um, so in terms of SROV, is there, is there any, uh, are there any issues between, uh, like resetting, like we spin up a new, can we reuse the same cluster or if, uh, we have a, a, another test coming in or do we need to tear down the whole thing and bring it back up again? One one of the major issues I discovered while playing with SRIV is that uh, some package servers have uh, SRIV disabled and bias. So uh, to overcome, like in my specific case, I had to manually get into the bias, change the setting, and after that it was working. I know that Jan is working on the uh, more automated way to deal with that. Uh, <clears throat> once it's done, then basically... Uh, there is no any dependency. You can recycle the server, uh, change the configuration, and basically go through the steps. Steps are known already. What was the uh, technique uh, technique you used in order to update the BIOS? Uh, no, not update, change. Uh, basically, just uh, I, I was using the serial uh, connection to the console, server console, and reboot the server, get into the BIOS, change the settings, save it, and then restart the server. Uh, I see. So, so in effect, um, um, it re it requires connection to the out of band, uh, the the out of band con or a rescue console. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. If 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 we split the testing of stuff like SROV from doing full end user uh, integration test where you may want multiple systems and you're showing how um, pods and containers and everything come up. If you move that as a separate thing and just have SRV support, I know Packet would be okay with dedicating. We, number one, you could keep something up. It'd also be cheaper to have it up all the time. No, I mean, and it's one it's one small set of systems or single system for testing those parts. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we also have a lot of interesting things floating around that. Like, for example, it turns out that some servers, you have to change the BIOS. Some flavors, you have to change the BIOS. Some flavors, apparently, you don't. Um, and, and so some of it may just be picking good flavors. But I, 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 would, I think we would generally like to keep all this stuff as reproducible as humanly possible. Um, and so, so that other people can come and run our tests. Okay, so let's set up a, a set of next uh, next tasks then. So, uh, so the first one is let's let's work out if we can run the C, the Circle CI stuff, uh, and see if that works uh, sim simultaneously. Um, Let's let's focus. Let's also focus on uh, very the very beginning. We're going to need this regardless as to what flavors we need, uh, which is um, how do we uh, connect in and how do we run arbitrary commands on our on packet.net. And eventually, those arbitrary commands can be spin up a um, spin up a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, well, so, so I, I'd actually strongly encourage folks to go take a look at the uh, cross-cloud CI stuff because I, I, it is utterly trivial to spin up a cross-cloud CI cluster on packet. Uh, there are really good directions there. The only thing I would strongly, strongly, strongly counsel is when you give the name um, of the cluster you're spinning up, the instructions will say, um, you know, cross-cloud CI. If we just give, make sure we give that the name NSM, so we don't collide in DNS with the stuff that the actual cross cloud guys are doing. Um, but that is like super, it's a super straightforward, super fast way to bring up a K cluster on packet. And it also, though I've not personally tried it, uh, should work on all the major cloud, provider, cloud providers and everything else. So rather than having to reinvent that wheel, I, I think we're probably best served by just using that wheel. 
Yeah, I think that's a great idea because eventually we're probably going to be asked about uh, does this does this thing work well on uh, on Google or Azure or or so on, and better than saying well it works on Packet is we've tested it on those platforms. Well, I, what I'd actually like to do is 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 once we get things working on Packet. Uh, because we do have some hardware needs, I'd love to start getting the CI in general working across all the major cloud providers so we can sort of say, well, yeah, because people will ask all the time, does this work on you know, the, the public cloud? And, and right now the answer is that is our intention. And I would love for the answer to be, well, uh, it, it passed CI last, <laughs> it passed CI earlier today on all the public clouds. Um, that's just a much stronger answer. Okay, so let's take a look at the at the cross cloud then. So I think if we focus on those two things to start off with, and then uh, we'll learn more about the the problem, and then we can circle around and uh, work out a more detailed set of next uh, next steps in regards to um, how do we inject network service mesh into into the cluster. Uh, and make sure that the daemon sets are all set up properly and uh, and so on. So I think um, so. I think starting off with spinning up the cluster uh, using um, using cross cloud and with the Circle CI stuff, uh, specifically using Circle CI, I, I think that'd be a good uh, a good approach. That might be another way as well. Is we can add in stuff with uh, Circle CI as a inside of a. Uh, and have some flag that disables uh, Circle CI and just automatically passes, except for the test that, uh, except for the patch that we want. And then once we're done with the patch and it's where we want it to be, and then we um, we remove those, um, re re we remove the um, uh, the portion that uh, that causes the uh, that causes it to automatically pass. So that that might be another another option as well. Yep. So I mean, there, there there are lots of ways to skin the cat. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just there, there's a little bit of schlogging through getting some of the Nick, you know, getting past some of the Mellanox issues, so that we can just literally just stand up containers. Because once we can stand up containers for VPP and T Rex, and optionally get Nix or SRIO VNix into those things um, as part of like a cross cloud CI thing on Packet. Once we're at that point. Dude, the world gets so flipping easy because there's so much stuff that just it becomes easy to do. Uh, the trick is getting over the initial usability problems that we're having. Yeah, and you guys have all been doing a fantastic job with documenting uh, that. So definitely, definitely keep it up because six months from now, a year from now, you know, if we need to go through some of this again. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we want to have as much information as possible uh, that's stored in that state. Yeah, and, and, and many thanks to our friends like Michael and, and Taylor and Lucina and, and Watson on the, the NFCNF comparisons. The, you guys have actually sort of wandered ahead in some of these directions already and figured out a bunch of stuff, and that's really helpful. Okay. Um, so is there, uh, is there anything else around this topic that uh, anyone wants to add? Uh, uh, hello, can you hear me? Well, hey, you're, you joined us. Yeah, I kind of came in, I, I went through audio hell in the beginning here and I won't give you all the details. My laptop wasn't seeing the audio devices and I went to call in and so I had to find, I'm in Ireland still, I had to find the access number, I found the access number for Zoom, but the caller ID wouldn't get me into, into I mean, the conference ID is apparently wrong in my um, uh, meeting invite. Uh, and so that's something we have to check um, to, to get us into the, this Zoom channel. Anyway, um, I, I, met, I was at DPDK um, yesterday and the day before, uh, DPDK user space here in Dublin. And I, I was talking to some people who are working on um, on some configuration 
APIs for configuring cores for for uh, uh, for containers. Um, some Intel people, I think, largely, and there was also some. Uh, uh, there's a lot of growing interest in containers in that space. I started talking a little bit about NSM. People weren't aware of that, um, and there's a there's an interest both to to talking about how their um, their APIs could be incorporated in our uh, extended endpoint um, uh, uh, API for configuring, um, you know, layer two and stuff that needs bare metal resources like cores and core tuning, pinning, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, there, there are also some, some usability things from DPDK that would be ultra, ultra helpful. I know there were some discussions about hot plug for DPDK, but it is an unbelievable pain that you know, there are apparently problems such that if I start a system up and I decide two hours later that I want to insert an SRIO VNIC or some other DPDK NIC, that I've got to go bounce the whole system to make it work. Um, that that turns out to be a real bummer in a more dynamic environment. Yeah, yes, there was a paper on the, presented on the hot plug API too. So there's several of these things coming together. And what, what I'm thinking is, is I got to go back to my notes and figure out what, which people I talk to and see maybe if we could have um, some kind of joint invite or joint event, or maybe having uh, them specifically to do a presentation about what they're doing in one of mine. I, I, think, I, think, that would be, I think that would be a really good idea. I know that I've been following a bunch of the things about dealing with numazones, which we're eventually going to care a lot yes. about. Yes, um, exactly. I, I've seen sort of two proposals there. One is the NUMA group, the NUMA manager proposal. Um, and the other that I've seen has been the CPU group proposal. And the CPU group proposal is kind of rough because it asks Kubernetes to change how it thinks about everything. Um, the NUMA manager is good as far as it goes, but I'm a little bit concerned about more complicated use cases. Let me sort of give you the example of what I mean by more complicated use cases. Imagine that I have a, a, a server, a node, and I've got two NICs, a 10 gig NIC and a 40 gig NIC. And they happen to have their PCI lanes coming into two different sockets. So 10 gig goes to socket zero, 40 gig goes to socket one. And I want to deploy a container that's going to grab both of those NICs, right, through network service mesh or whatever mechanism. Um, I, I would like to be able to pin to some number of cores for socket zero to serve the 10 gig NIC and some number of cores for socket one to serve the 40 gig NIC. But yes. But it's not clear how to do that in the new manager proposal, because the new manager proposal would simply say, okay, um, for the 10 gig NIC, you know, this is my suggestion as to the cores that you give this thing, and you get conflicting advice for the 40 gig NIC, and there's no really clear way how that gets resolved. So I, I've also been sort of rumbling in my head that something sort of similar to the pattern we have for network service manager um, might help there. Because yes, this comes down to a this comes down to a C, a, to a, a CPU set problem, if I understand correctly, where you need to create a CPU set for the pod, uh, for the the cores that it's supposed to pin to, and, and and quite honestly, there are a lot of these situations that you kind of have to deal with. I think in ways that are similar to the NSM, um, not the NSM itself, but same pattern. Yes, exactly, and I think that there's some related issues too with tuning the cores and being able to step up the frequency and doing power management on the cores that can have interesting effects they're working on too. So uh, in any case, we um, uh, it, there's an opportunity for us to have some um, collaboration on this stuff as well, because there's some fairly uh, 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 significant frustrations on the part of these individuals with regard to uh, Kubernetes, because they were have been focused to this point on somehow trying to you know plug this stuff into standard Kubernetes network. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think part of the frustration may be that. Um, there, there's a strategy that was taken with OpenStack, which was just take all the nitty gritty details and make them part of the global API. And there's absolutely no way that that's happening for Kubernetes, right? And this is where I think it's like, I think the CPU group guys have run into, which is, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to change entirely. Yeah. This works just for your very niche use case. Um, so. I've had a couple conversations that are exactly like that in the past week, and it's like, it doesn't support this. So it's like, oh, well, we'll go talk to the Kubernetes people. They'll see the, the, the value of it, and then they'll let it in. I was like, no, this is more complex than stuff they've rejected by far <laughs> than 
Like, uh, you're going to have a hard time with it. I, I've, I've yeah. had conversations with, I've, I've been to a bunch of the work group meetings to follow these proposals. And the thing that's really interesting is the thing I hear most often is uh, an acknowledgement of the importance of the use case and a very polite pushing away on the solution that's been proposed. So, well, it, yeah. these are ever more reasons why we, what we're doing is really necessi necessity to make reasonable NFE type workloads to, 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 to work in a Kubernetes environment. Um, and, the, and so it, it's all the more a reason why we, we have to have these conversations, I think, um, particularly as we uh, talk about how, how we're going to provision with, um, the, uh, you know, provision these um, core dependent types of things like the use case you're talking about, Ed. So um, quick, quick question. Uh, we're at the top of the hour before, uh, before, before we close it up. You've been working on the VPP stuff as well for the cross connect. Are you blocked on anything? Do you need help with anything? Well, I, I, I will contact you either outside, um, you know, um, directly or will, uh, uh, or, or, or will connect on the, um, um, on the, on the channel. That and sounds good. I just, I, I am not really quite blocked yet because I don't even know exactly where I'm blocked. But okay. um, I need well, to, uh, I will be uh, working on this uh, um, but, uh, uh, quite a bit next week. This week, because of, of being here on DPDK, I had some, some limited time beyond, uh, you know, and with traveling on Tuesday and so on. Okay, so I'll, I need to close up this particular meeting, but, uh, you know, we can, we can discuss uh, afterwards. Uh, chat chat room is probably the best because I know that uh, a couple of people have to drop off who are interested. Uh, with that, uh, thank you everyone for attending and uh, we will see you. We will see you all uh, next week. Yes. Okay. Cheers. Um, Thanks. Right. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mate. Bye guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.